It was 9.30am, November 13th, the year 2000. A male caller phoned an advertising company in the city of Wroclaw, Poland. Wroclaw is the fourth largest city in Poland and has a population of about 635,000 people. At different times throughout history, Wroclaw has been part of Bohemia, Hungary, the Austrian Empire, Prussia and Germany. It became part of Poland in 1945 as a result of border changes after the Second World War. The male caller wanted to speak to the owner of the advertising company, Dariusz Januszewski. He needed three advertising signs made up and he needed it done urgently. But it was the mother of Dariusz who answered the call. When she asked further questions about the job, the caller refused to speak to her. He demanded to speak to Dariusz. Dariusz wasn't in the office, and so his mother gave the caller his cell phone number. She didn't recognise the caller's voice, and he didn't leave a name, although she thought he sounded professional. Dariusz returned to the office later that day. He mentioned that he had been contacted by the male caller about the urgent job, and he arranged to meet with him later that afternoon. At 4pm, Dariusz left the office to meet with the caller. He left his car in the parking lot, which his family said was unusual as he usually took his car when meeting with customers away from the office. Dariusz never returned for his car, and he never made it home to his wife. He never contacted anyone to let them know where he was, which was completely out of character. His wife reported him missing. It was four weeks later on a cold, overcast morning in December. Fishermen were casting out into the river Odra. The spot they were fishing at is a remote, hard spot to get to. It is 60 miles out of the city of Wroclaw, so you can only get there by car. But then you have to park and walk several hundred metres through a forest to get to the river. It wasn't a popular spot. It wasn't frequented by anyone other than fishermen and even that wasn't very often. The fishermen spotted what at first they thought was a log, but as it drifted closer, they saw a head of hair. A closer inspection revealed they had discovered the body of a male. The male had serious injuries. There were signs he had been beaten and tortured. His head was in a noose, and his arms and feet were tied with rope that connected to the noose, so he was in a backward cradle position. It was designed so that the noose would get tighter the more he moved his arms and his legs. The fishermen immediately contacted police, who arrived and established a crime scene. Police divers searched the river for any further evidence, but they found nothing. Other police searched the surrounding banks and forest area, but they also turned up nothing. The body had been in the water for quite some time, so zero forensic evidence was located. Police searched through missing person reports and found a match to 35-year-old Dariusz Januszewski. In the post-mortem, the forensic pathologist discovered Januszewski's stomach was completely empty. This indicated he had been starved for at least three days prior to his death. At first, the pathologist believed the cause of death was strangulation. However, based on the amount of water found in the lungs, he changed his position and believe Januszewski may have been still alive when he was thrown in the river. There was no doubt Januszewski had been murdered. Investigators believe, given the way he was killed, it may have been gang-related. They also believe more than one person may have been responsible. Januszewski was over six feet tall and weighed over 200 pounds. But criminal psychologist David Holmes believed that given the circumstances, it indicated to him there was a great deal of anger involved. This was extremely personal, and whoever was responsible had made it their mission to punish Januszewski. If police could establish a motive, it would give them a clearer picture if it was gang-related or maybe more personal. They interviewed Januszewski's wife, family, friends, and business associates. They learnt he was a successful young businessman. He was popular, friendly, 
a gentle guy liked by everyone. His hobby was playing his guitar and writing music for a rock band he played in with a few friends. His business records were examined and there were no signs of any trouble at all. There were no problems in his marriage and he and his wife were planning to adopt a child in the near future. He had no criminal record and was not linked to any criminal associates. No debts, no enemies. Police came up with zero potential motives for murder. The investigation stalled very early on. No forensic evidence, no witnesses, no motive, nothing. The Polish media started referring to the murder as the perfect crime. Police turned to a popular Polish TV show, 997. 997 being the emergency telephone number in Poland. The show is the Polish version of America's Most Wanted. It had already helped solve several other cases police had been stuck on in the past, and it would help give prime time exposure to Januszewski's case. The broadcast, though, ended up being considered a disappointment. There were plenty of hits on the website in the months and years after the episode aired. Police were surprised to learn that the website hits had come from as far as Japan, South Korea, and the United States, which was unusual for the Polish television show. But they got no useful information at all. They were no closer to solving the case. The police had no idea who had killed Januszewski. The only other useful piece of information that they had was the call that was made to Januszewski's office at 9.30am the day of his disappearance. That was traced to a payphone down the street from the office. The payphone was also used to call Januszewski's cell phone less than one minute after the call to his office. But police weren't even sure the calls were related to his disappearance. The police investigation was completely abandoned in June 2001. It was sent to the cold case shelf. Januszewski's family and his friends remained haunted by his death, but the media attention had died off. The case disappeared from the minds of the public. Around 18 months later, in 2003, Roslav police conducted a routine review of all unsolved murder cases. The file of Darius Januszewski made its way to the desk of Detective Jacek Rublewski. Rublewski was 38 years old and had been a police officer for nine years. He had strong Catholic values and liked the idea of being a cop and being able to represent the good, fighting evil. When he wasn't working as a detective, he studied psychology at university to try and better understand the criminal mind. Rublevsky was vaguely familiar with Januszewski's murder. He remembered hearing about it at the time, but he didn't know any of the details. He studied the file for several hours when he first got it trying to find any sign of a clue that had been missed by the original investigators. He found nothing, and was initially as stumped as they were. He wasn't sure about the organised crime angle. Didn't seem to make sense to him given Januszewski's background, unless it was a case of mistaken identity. What was perfectly clear to him though, was the offender, or offenders, had a severe hatred, and wanted him to suffer. The case stayed with Rublevsky. He studied the file again the next day, and the day after, trying to find something, anything. His persistence paid off. Januszewski had his cell phone with him when he left his office, and it had never been found. Rublevsky focused on trying to track down Januszewski's phone. That was his starting point. He wasn't jumping for joy at the lead. He was fully aware the chances of finding it were very slim. It could easily have been missed by the police divers and still be at the bottom of the river, or just about anywhere else for that matter. He enlisted the help of a newly hired telecommunications specialist. The specialist explained that if the phone wasn't lost or destroyed, and it was still being used, they could easily track it, but they would need the IMEI number. They were in luck. After all this time, Januszewski's wife still had the receipt from when the phone was purchased and on that receipt was the IMEI number. Rublevsky couldn't believe his luck when they discovered the phone was still actively being used. Rublevsky tracked down the current owner of the phone. This owner had only recently purchased it. They were quickly eliminated from the investigation, but Rublevsky tracked down the person they had brought it from. And on and on it went. 
The phone had been bought and sold several times since Januszewski disappeared. By working backwards through the phone owners, Rublevsky eventually found the man who had possession of it only days after Januszewski disappeared. This man had purchased the phone from an internet auction site, Allegro, just three days after Januszewski went missing. Rublevsky was able to find the listing. The seller's username on the auction site was Chris B7. Rublevsky traced the registration details of Chris B7 and found out that username belonged to a man by the name of Christian Bala. Christian Bala was the eldest of two children. Born into a middle-class family, his father was a construction worker and a taxi driver. He was a bright and intellectual child and a good student. Although through junior school and high school, he often had conflict with other students. He was very egocentric and considered himself to be superior to other students. He was the first member of his family to go to university where he studied philosophy. His big ego and supreme confidence remained, but at university he was immensely popular, both with fellow students and with lecturers. Some considered him to be a student Casanova as he attracted a lot of female attention. One professor described him as having a very inquisitive and rebellious mind. Through university, he started to turn into a bit of a fabricator of stories about himself. He liked to play games with people. He made up so many stories that it got to the point where even his friends didn't know what stories were and weren't true about him. Bala was one of the brightest philosophy students at the University of Wroclaw. He graduated in 1997 with the highest possible grades and then enlisted in the PhD program. He always dreamed of an academic career. However, things changed. He had married his sweetheart, Stasha, and she had given birth to a son. He now had a family to support, so he dropped out of the PhD program and bought a cleaning business. He was incredibly smart, but he wasn't a good businessman. He blew all of the money that came in, and by 1999, he had filed for bankruptcy. His marriage crumbled as well. Stasha said the main problem with their marriage is that Bala couldn't stop cheating on her. There were always other women. They divorced in 1999, and two years later, Bala was living abroad. He had lived in Asia and the United States, making a living by writing for travel magazines, teaching scuba diving, and teaching English. In 2003, Bala published his first novel, titled A Mock. Nothing stood out in the initial background check of Bala. Hardly any criminal record, just very minor stuff. Rublevsky was keeping a very open mind. He thought it was quite possible Bala had a totally innocent explanation for selling Yanishevsky's phone. Maybe he'd found it. Maybe it had been given to him by somebody else. Or maybe he'd even bought it at a second-hand store. As Rublevsky couldn't go overseas to speak to Bala, and there was nothing really jumping out at him on his background check, he decided to focus in on the novel he had written, A Mock. A Mock is a sadistic novel. It contains graphic sex and violent scenes. The story revolves around the main character, Chris. He is a bored Polish intellectual who is into philosophy. His wife catches him having sex with her best friend, and so she leaves him. Chris then starts abusing alcohol and goes on a sexual rampage sleeping with many other women. Throughout the book, Chris mocks traditional philosophers and criticises the Catholic Church. In one scene, Chris and a buddy steal the statue of St Anthony from a church. In chapter 9 of the book, Chris murders his girlfriend Mary by tying a noose around her neck and stabbing her. He conceals the murder so well he is never caught. The main character Chris also hints in the book that he had previously killed a man who had done him wrong. The book was published in 2003, and it didn't do too well. Few Polish bookstores carried it because of its graphic nature, and those that did carry it placed it on the high shelves, out of the way, so children couldn't pick it up. Despite only selling a few thousand copies, Bala said this, I'm truly convinced that one day my book will be appreciated. 
History teaches that some works of art have to wait ages before they are recognised. Rublevsky considered a few things. Chris, the name of the main character, is the English version of Bala's first name, Christian. It is also the name he used on the auction site to sell Yanishevsky's phone. The book describes getting away with murder. The victim in the book is a woman, however there are similarities with the noose around her neck. But what made the hairs on the back of Rublevsky's neck stand up was the part of the book where Chris sells the knife he used in the murder on an internet auction site. The detail of Yanishevsky's phone being sold on an internet auction site after his murder was never made known to the public. Rublevsky could see parallels between the book and the real-life murder investigation of Yanishevsky. His thought was that there were too many parallels to be just a coincidence. Rublevsky looked into the character of Chris more closely and found the following similarities to Bala. Both Chris and Bala were consumed by philosophy. Both had been left by their wives. Both had a company go bankrupt. Both travelled around the world both abused alcohol. And the scene where Chris stole the statue of St. Anthony matched one of the entries on Bala's criminal record. He'd been arrested for stealing a statue of St. Anthony from a church. Rublevsky knew that these similarities were evidence of nothing. It's quite common for authors to draw from their own life experiences when writing books and creating characters. Rublevsky wondered, though, if Bala had gotten the inspiration for Chris's murder scene from a real-life event. Bala became his prime suspect for the murder of Dariusz Yanishevsky. Although he was quite aware he didn't really have any evidence, other than the fact that Bala had sold Yanishevsky's phone three days after his disappearance. That was nowhere near enough to extradite Bala back to Poland. Rublevsky couldn't even find a connection between Bala and Yanishevsky. There was no evidence that they had known each other. Rublevsky didn't question Bala's family or close friends. He couldn't risk them tipping off Bala, because the fear was he would never return to Poland if he thought the police were after him. Bala had made sporadic visits back home to briefly visit family and friends, so Rublevsky would be patient and hope that Bala would return again. Rublevsky continued studying Bala's book. He handed out chapters of the book to different officers and got them to analyse it trying to find any other clues or hidden messages that could be connected to Yanishevsky's case. Rublevsky became obsessed with the last line of the book, which reads, This was the one killed by blind jealousy. Rublevsky believed Bala may be giving them the motive to Yanishevsky's murder with this line. Jealousy. He also became fixated on the part of the book where Chris hints at murdering a man who had done him wrong in the past. Was Bala telling them something? Rublevsky was undertaking a very unorthodox investigation method, and not everybody supported it. He was warned to proceed very, very carefully. A work of fiction didn't mean murder. But Rublevsky was convinced the mock was a roadmap which led to the murder of Darius Yanishevsky. As Rublevsky looked harder at Bala, he found something else on the internet auction site Allegro. One month before Yanishevsky disappeared, Bala had clicked on a book titled Accidental Suicide or Criminal Hanging. It was a police manual, and in it were descriptions of different ways to tie a noose. Again, it was evidence of nothing, but it was another little piece of information that when added to everything else Rublevsky knew, didn't look good for Bala. Bala eventually returned to Poland in 2005. Rublevsky had been working Yanishevsky's case for two years. Bala's passport flagged when he entered the country. He was arrested on the 5th of September after leaving a drugstore. Bala gave away nothing at first. He denied having anything to do with the murder. He was dismissive of police questions and said he didn't even know Yanishevsky, had never met him, had never even heard of him had no idea who he was. When Bala was asked about selling his cell phone, he said he couldn't remember where he got it from. It was five years ago. They then questioned Bala about a mock. 
Byler agreed he had used different parts of his life in the novel, such as the stealing of the statue. But Byler said, show me an author who doesn't do that. Then they asked the question, did you have help killing Yanishevsky? Byler almost looked offended and chillingly replied he did not have any help. He killed him on his own. But almost as soon as he said that, he started urgently looking around the room and started making weird facial expressions. He asked for something to drink because he was feeling terrible, then requested a doctor. The interview had to be suspended and an ambulance was called. They examined him but couldn't find anything wrong with him. They said he was fine to continue. The interview was restarted. Bala retracted his confession, then refused to say anything further. He wouldn't sign the interview documents, so the police were unable to use what he had said because it wasn't signed. He was given a polygraph test. The results were declared inconclusive. In Poland, police can hold a suspect for 48 hours, then they have to either lay charges or release. The case against Bala was still circumstantial, at best. There was no solid evidence against him at all. No motive, no confession, and police still hadn't been able to link Bala to Yanishevsky. They decided to charge him with selling stolen property, being Yanishevsky's phone, and for paying a bribe. This is something that had nothing to do with the murder investigation. It was something police uncovered in their extensive background investigation of Bala. The charges meant Bala would have to relinquish his passport and remain in Poland. Rublevsky had worked hard on the case for two years, but he just couldn't connect the dots. He felt the investigation slipping away from him. As he was sitting back flicking through Bala's passport, he noticed stamps for South Korea, Japan and the United States. It clicked almost immediately. The hits on the page dedicated to Yanishevsky's murder on the 997 website. At the time, they were baffled as to why a local Polish case was attracting attention from those countries. Rublevsky compared the dates of the website hits to the dates Bala was in those countries, and they were a perfect match. It strengthened his belief he was on the right track. But again, it still was an evidence of murder. Meanwhile, Bala was a free man while he was waiting for the two charges to be heard. He was accusing police of harassing him, trying to persecute him for his art. He also made a complaint he was kidnapped and tortured by police when he was first arrested. He got some support from friends and members of the public who were outraged police were unfairly targeting a man because of a novel he wrote. One of Bala's previous girlfriends set up a defence fund for him, and an internet campaign was launched about the police persecution of Bala. The campaign said Bala was being persecuted for writing a book that went against the Catholic Church and Polish tradition. Bala became a victim. They contacted human rights organisations and letters poured in from around the world defending Bala and his right to freedom of expression in accordance with Article 19 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. People were demanding that Rublevsky and other officers involved in the case be held accountable and brought to justice. A psychiatric evaluation was ordered on Bala. He was found to have narcissistic traits. He considered himself to be a superior human being, smarter, stronger, and much more intelligent than anyone else. Rublevsky was still trying desperately to find the evidence he needed to charge Bala with murder. He re-examined the phone calls that were made from the payphone to Yanishevsky's office and cell phone. This time with the help of the telecommunications specialist, they discovered the calls had been made with a phone card that had a unique identifying number. Although they weren't able to trace who had bought the card, they could find out what other calls were made with it. They discovered the card had been used to make 32 calls over a three-month period. Along with the calls to Yanishevsky's office and cell phone, calls were also made to Bala's parents, his girlfriend at the time, other friends of Bala, and his business associates. Rublevsky didn't really doubt it before, but now he was certain he had the right man but it still wasn't enough to charge Bala with murder. 
so Rublevsky looked further into his breakup with his ex-wife Stasha. Rublevsky had tried to interview Stasha numerous times before, but she flat out refused. So this time, Rublevsky tracked down one of her friends, who was able to fill him in with what he needed to know. Barla was extremely possessive and controlling of Stasha. He was also physically violent towards her. He would constantly check her phone, demanding to know who she was talking to, and then he would beat her up, accusing her of cheating on him even though he cheated on her countless times. Barla could do whatever he liked, but he expected Stasha to do as he told her. After their divorce, Barla remained extremely possessive of Stasha. He would stalk her and did his best to continue to control her every move. In the summer of 99, after the divorce, Stasha went out with her friend that was now speaking to Rublevsky. They went to the Crazy Horse nightclub in Rotslav, Stasha started chatting to Darius Janashevsky in the club. Stasha's friend knew Janashevsky from around town, so she was certain it was him she was speaking to. Rublevsky was sure he had just connected the dots between Bala and Janashevsky, but he needed to hear it from Stasha. Armed with this information, he was finally able to get Stasha to talk to him. What finally convinced her was when Rublevsky showed her sections of a mock. Stasha was so disturbed by similarities in the book to what she had experienced in real life that she agreed to talk. Stasha confirmed that she had met Janoszewski at Crazy Horse Nightclub. They spent the night just talking, after which Janoszewski gave her his phone number. They later went on a date and checked into a motel. However, Stasha says when she found out Janoszewski was married, she left before anything happened. A few weeks after this incident, Bala showed up at her apartment in a drunken state. He kicked down her door and beat her, screaming he knew everything about her and Janoszewski. He even screamed out what hotel and what room number they went to. As he was beating Stasha, he was screaming he had hired a private detective and he knew everything. When Stasha later heard Janoszewski had gone missing, she asked Bala if he had anything to do with it. He said he hadn't. Stasha didn't pursue it any further or go to the police with this information, as she didn't believe Bala was capable of murder. Upon hearing this, Rublevsky immediately thought back to the last line in a mock. This was the one killed by blind jealousy. That line made a whole lot more sense now. Bala was charged with the murder of Darius Janoszewski. The first day of the trial was the 22nd of February 2007. In Poland, the jury is made up by the presiding judge, one other judge, and three citizens. Bala complained his novel was being misinterpreted and that the police had taken random parts of his life and presented them in a fictional story that suited their theory of the murder. He again claimed he had never met Janoszewski and didn't know who he was. Police had the information from Stasha, but there was no corroborating evidence. It was Stasha's word against Bala's. Bala was claiming Stasha was just being a vindictive ex-wife, making up stories trying to get him in trouble. Maybe he could have convinced the jury of that. Maybe not. But police now had more evidence against him. After charging Bala with murder, they searched his parents' home. Bala had left some belongings there before heading overseas. In amongst those belongings, they found a notebook with details of Janoszewski and his company written down. They also found a pen and a business card with Janoszewski's name and company details on them. Bala had always maintained that he never knew Janoszewski, had never met him, never heard his name, didn't know a thing about him. It was going to be hard to stick to that story now. Prior to the trial commencing, the judge had made a ruling that a mock could not be used as evidence at the trial. The judge didn't consider the description of a fictional murder as evidence. But police had a lot more information now. A witness came forward and testified that Bala had questioned her extensively about Janoszewski prior to his disappearance. Bala wanted to know everything about him, where he worked, 
who his friends and family were, how he could be contacted. A friend of Barla's also came forward and testified that during a New Year's Eve party in 2000, Barla was at the same club as Stasha. Barla thought a male bartender was making advances towards Stasha, and he started screaming at him that he would take care of him, and he had already dealt with such a guy. It took five people to restrain Barla that night. After all the evidence was presented, the jury retired to reach their verdict. Guilty. Barla was sentenced to 25 years prison. He immediately appealed his conviction. The appeal cited logical and factual inconsistencies in the trial, one being the cause of death. Medical examiners could not agree on what the cause of death was. One testified Yanishevsky had been strangled. Another testified he had drowned. Bala also used a comment made by the judge in the trial as a grounds for his appeal. During the trial, the judge commented she wasn't sure if Bala had acted alone or with an accomplice. To the surprise of many, the appeals court annulled his conviction. They ordered a new trial. But they ruled that Bala would have to remain in prison until the outcome of the new trial was reached. The appeals court stated that there was an undoubted connection between Bala and the murder, but there were gaps in the logical chain of evidence. Bala's retrial was heard in December 2008. He was convicted of murder for a second time. The sentence of 25 years was upheld. Bala maintains his innocence and says he's being set up. According to him, all of the evidence against him was planted and somebody is out to destroy him. Wobleski claims that the crime scene in the book M was a key for his investigation, which is absurd. He must be, I don't know, an idiot, complete idiot, illiterate idiot. The book is kind of language game uh, which has no relationship with um, anything in a real life. Some suspect a mock was a confession, written to clear Bala's guilty conscience. Others don't see it that way. They believe Bala's desire was to achieve literary immortality by writing what he believed was the perfect story. He's been quoted as saying, There has never been a book quite like this. They believe Bala was too smart for his own good. He thought he was so intellectually superior to everyone else that he never considered being caught was a possibility. That's why he freely wrote about the murder and left behind so much evidence. Bala had started writing a second novel at the time of his arrest. Police seized his computer with the beginning stages of this second novel on it. They also found that Bala was collecting information on Stash's new boyfriend. He had even posted on an internet forum asking if anyone knew him. They believe Stash's new boyfriend was going to be Bala's second murder victim, who he would then write about in his second novel. Bala has vowed to finish his second novel, which he promises will even be more shocking. 